All right, good morning and good afternoon to everyone who may be tuning in or watching this video later. I'm joining you from the northeast of Brazil in Bahia, where I've been throughout this whole COVID-19 time. Um, and I'm really grateful that Tyson Atlio has joined me today for a conversation around Indigenous-led conservation. So he's definitely a go, not the go-to as he says, but he's a go-to guy within this realm of Indigenous-led conservation, and you'll soon find out why. But Tyson, just to start off, can you just introduce yourself how you will, please? Sure, thank you. And good morning, Victoria, British Columbia. The, uh, the territories of the Lekwungen-speaking people, very fortunate to call this place one of my homes. I'm, of course, also from the Ahousa First Nation on the west coast of Vancouver Island, where I carry the name Aikatius. I'm the son of A Inchat from our community. He's one of our three principal hereditary chiefs. Um, and I continue to support our hereditary governance system at home um, and our people at home and our community. But I'm also an economic development director for the Nature Conservancy, uh, a large global conservation organization. I'm very passionate about my work with the Conservancy in support of Indigenous-led conservation around the world. And very mm. happy to be here to talk about that. Thank you so much. So let's just get right into it. I'm sure there will be questions that come up as we go. And if anyone has any questions who's listening, feel free to ask in the comment area. But just to get into it, can you tell me what is the Nature Conservancy? Sure, yeah. I'm not going to do it justice as an organization, but it um, it's a large global conservation organization operating, I believe, in 76 countries around the world. And you've got several mm -hmm. thousand staff, uh, many of whom are doing amazing things uh, to protect and conserve nature in partnership um, with local communities and indigenous peoples and organizations and other partner organizations around the world. Um, and so yeah, that's essentially what it is. It's an organization that aims to um, protect and conserve um, uh, you know, the, the lands and waters on which all life depends. And that's a mission that I very much align with uh, as an Indigenous person and as an individual. Mm. So how exactly do they do that? Like what what is happening on the ground in these 76 communities to protect and preserve nature? It's a huge question. <laughs> 76 countries, in fact. Um, around the world, uh, many, many communities. And so maybe I can talk a little bit about some of um, the work that I do along with a lot of our colleagues in Canada and in, in North America here. And in mm -hmm. fact, I actually just got off a call this morning where I was helping to facilitate an effective virtual collaboration workshop um, mm -hmm. that um, a small group of us had put on for what we call the Voice Choice and Action Network. And so the Voice Choice Action Network is a, a, it's a, it's a group of people um, that are doing Indigenous-led conservation around the world. And it's not only a group of conservancy employees, but also a group of community partners, so mm -hmm. community leaders and so on. And so this morning there was, uh, I think, 50 people on the call from around the world, um, from Brazil, um, from North America, from, um, I believe, Kenya. we had people from Kenya, we had people from Hawaii. I'm not sure if there's anyone from Mongolia on the call, but um, other geographies around the world anyways. And the idea was we come together to collaborate virtually and learn from one another and share best practices for indigenous led conservation. And now adapting to the current circumstance, learning with each other about how to effectively virtually collaborate and build relationships um, where you can't gather together, which is of course core <laughs> to a lot of indigenous people's culture and core to relationships as human beings. So how do we do that at this time? And so that's an example of some of the kind of work that is might be considered unconventional uh, conservation work, but connecting people, mm -hmm. uh, connecting ideas is a huge part of what the community does around the world. Bring people together to share mm -hmm. best practices and values for, uh, for conservation. Other projects, of course, that we do um, specifically focused on kind of the indigenous led conservation work uh, here in um, Canada, for example, is supporting groups um, um, in the Northwest Territories for um, supporting them in the establishment of the new Thida Ne Nene um, protected areas, mm -hmm. uh, indigenous guardian programs, um, entrepreneurship programs, and, and sustainable development programs. And so we've kind of got 
four key pillar areas that we focus on for indigenous med conservation is that and that is ensuring that indigenous peoples and local communities um, have secure access to their resources and decision making authority, authority over, over their resources mm -hmm. and also their, that their leadership capacity is strengthened um, and um, that we're supporting multi-stakeholder platforms for engagement and for exercising rights and I'm just actually backing up we take a rights-based approach ensuring that indigenous rights are respected um, for all the work that gets done. And then the, the work that I principally focus on is ensuring that conservation work generates sustainable economic opportunities um, mm -hmm. where that where that can fit. So I have so many questions for you. <laughs> I knew you were the guy to talk to. <laughs> um, does a lot of great work around the world and we have a lot of wonderful people on the team. Awesome. And I mean, I know what little I know about you. I feel like you would be picky in accepting a position with whichever organization, um, you know? So why, like, what about the conservancy, the nature conservancy do you think works and sets it apart from other organizations that, you know, maybe are very left leaning, environmentally focused, but do it in a, in a way that's impossible to escape the colonialism and the colonial values. Like, why do you feel like there's space for indigenous laws within the nature conservancy? Yeah, it's a good question. A big question. Some of the latter stuff. Um, the the reason why I first joined the conservancy is that as an organization, they proved to me in some work that they were doing um, that they valued the knowledge of our people, and by our people, I meant you know, the Ahousat community and our our history and uh, um, our governance system. And so I saw an organization that many might consider to have a challenged past in terms of how conservation can alienate indigenous peoples from their traditional territories mm -hmm. an organization and people within it who are willing to learn from those mistakes and to move forward with genuine partnership and intent um, to let or not to let but to um, to, to invite in um, other ways of knowing and being and to collaborate and truly collaborate with those ways of knowing of being as, an, as a global organization that's got you know significant opportunities to advance what I think are some of our most challenging issues right now, which is you know the environmental crisis. Mm -hmm. And so, um, such a large organization can bring such wonderful people together mm -hmm. and, and elevate knowledge in such a wonderful and meaningful way. It's a science-based organization, but there's a really strong and quickly growing trend that acknowledges. Um, the knowledge um, of indigenous communities in particular, um, and not just indigenous communities, but um, knowledge that comes out of community, diverse communities, communities of color, um, communities of, of different um, orientations. And so um, kind of opening up that diversity, equity, and inclusion um, component into the conservation sector, the conservancy is really, in my opinion, helping to pave that pathway, which mm -hmm. looks like a much better future, in my opinion. So I saw um, them in the people and the organization willing um, to kind of elevate the knowledge of indigenous peoples, um, to respect the rights of indigenous peoples, things like mm -hmm. the United Nations Declaration. Right. Uh, I also saw an alignment of values for myself personally. And so how mm -hmm. I was raised and my teachings and my understandings also talk about um, taking care of, um, we have a responsibility to take care of uh, the natural world. And so mm -hmm. conservation seemed like a very natural alignment to me in terms of we need to do that while also taking care of our people. Mm -hmm. And I, I found a fit here that allows me to do both things um, mm -hmm. to, the, you know, to the best of my abilities. It's not always perfect and it doesn't always work as well as everybody would like, but um, mm -hmm. I, can, I can be quite happy with it. Mm. How do you feel about the United, ne United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples? and how it functions in Canada. Do you think that it's really being implemented by provinces, territories, and you know federal government? Or do you think it still has a, a ways to go to really be implemented into law and respected in the way that perhaps it should? What are your thoughts around that? I could take a few different approaches at, at thinking about that question, uh, mm -hmm. political position, but it, as, a, as, as someone that works in the conservation sector, for example, I get to see um, and hear about a lot of the experiences of other peoples, other indigenous communities, and so on. And so for me, recognition is always the first step. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's good to have that recognition. 
of the United Nations Declaration um, in Canada, and of course in British Columbia with the passing of a bill. But naturally, the implementation of, of such things, um, especially in a place like Canada, where you have a strong history of, of, of cultural um, oppression um, and so on, it will take a very long time to work through um, a lot of the relationships um, that have been damaged and the traumas that we've experienced as Indigenous peoples in this country. And so I applaud the, the recognition of the, the declaration, and I'm trying to stay very hopeful about the potential for that to uh, change the future of Canada uh, and for our communities in a positive way. To date, I mean, obviously, it's it's, it's, it's it hasn't been implemented to its fullest potential, of course, but that will take right. That will take time. Well, something I've heard from you in like, you know, we haven't had too many conversations, but something I've picked up is you talk a lot about patience. It's going to take time. You know, you're clearly um, using a generational rhetoric. Is that something that comes from your values and teachings? And can you explain a little bit more what you mean when you say we need to have patience and these things take time and they take generations? Yeah, that's an answer. Question. Um, healing takes time. Um, mm -hmm. Healing takes intention and effort. Learning takes time and intention and effort. And we mm -hmm. kind of live in an era of instant gratification. And we can't expect um, we can't expect moving forward to be easy. Um, but we but we still have to try. We have to you know practice our patience, practice our forgiveness, um, especially mm -hmm. of self and of others. And these are teachings that I hold personally um, in our family, of course, um, and I believe that comes from um, some of our traditional teachings. I like to draw parallels um, to understanding how we can move forward together. For me, that's very important. Collaboration, um, working across difference, and I'm sure that um, you've heard that from me as well. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in, in this COVID-19 um, current situation, there's only one other time where I've really experienced uh, the stay at home requirement, mm -hmm. go slow, be mindful, be patient orders. And that's, mm -hmm. during, that's during our cultural traditions and our practices in, at home. Um, and so for me, it, 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 you know, there's that, I draw that personal connection to, to those lessons and teachings. And if those lessons and teachings are coming from our ceremony, we know that they come from, uh, you know, a place of spiritual and natural law. And so uh, we learn about this from that observation. And this is how I tie it back to conservation for me, is that we observe and learn from and be in our language, ha hopa, by our, by the natural world. Um, and, and so, you know, some people might find that inconsiderate because people are suffering and, and, and um, as a result of this circumstance. Um, from my personal perspective, you know, we have been violating these natural laws and we've been breaking protocols that were established over, over with life-giving forces over a great deal of time. You know, the laws of collaboration and reciprocity, um, and, you know, we've been breaching those protocols. So how do we take lesson um, from our traditions and return mm -hmm. to um, those protocols? It's not going to be easy and it's not going to look exactly the same and it's never going to be perfect, but we have to, um, you know, walk a hard road to finding how to get back to that mm. no other experience in my lifetime has reminded us so much that we're really all in this together mm. <laughs> uh, issues that transcend a lot of our existing social boundaries um in terms of a timeline and so mm. you know how do we come together how do we come together more effectively it's very challenging thank you for asking my next question tyson <laughs> How do we come together more effectively? Yeah, that's, that's how do we, you know, to define this question more, more so, how do we use this time, this COVID quarantine, social distancing measure, restriction, you know, which is relative to a lot of Indigenous ceremonies, there are traces of certain laws or protocols like observation and sacrifice and suffering and all of the teaching that can come from that. How do we use this time um, to come together more effectively, to walk out of this in a way where we're a little bit more organized, a little bit more together. Yeah, there's a, a broad spectrum of how this impacts individuals, families, mm -hmm. communities, regions, countries, and the globe. And right. it's very hard to kind of pinpoint um, 
it's, ob it's obviously very hard to talk about how um, to do those things other than from a, a personal opinion in terms of how I deal with it personally and how our family deal with it and how the communities mm -hmm. deal with it. And I applaud, for example, our community and coastal communities um, for doing exactly what they do well, which is um, mm -hmm. coming together, supporting one another. Um, and so we see a lot of that happening. Mm -hmm. And we see that happening, I think, trending around the world right now, where people are mm -hmm. recognizing, or there's a, there's a growing recognition that we are actually in this together. We do need to support one another. And so I'll reference again that call that I was on this morning where, you know, we had 40 people that took time out of their day. Some, it was very early in the morning or very late at night, join mm -hmm. us on the call to learn more about how to make these connections across mm -hmm. the country. We all want to have good connections. We all want to have healthy, happy, meaningful, and positive connections to other people. Um, I think we get caught up in the race. And so this has given us an opportunity to slow down, reflect, mm -hmm. be mindful, if possible, practice gratefulness and reflect on natural abundance and so on. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it comes down to each individual and how this impacts and affect them for how you know they're going to move forward past it. I think at a, at a bigger perspective, we have a really interesting opportunity right now to rethink um, how we recover uh, from mm -hmm. particular global recessions. So we know historically mm -hmm. that um, recessions, post-recession um, increases or post-recession economic growth um, is not equitable. Um, so, uh, you know, community marginalized communities suffer uh, more so than wealthy mm -hmm. communities for example in um, in post-recession growth and mm -hmm. so how do, we, how do we address those trends um, in this particular circumstance by taking a focus in my opinion on the ecological crisis uh, kind of um, diversity equity and inclusion issues mm -hmm. uh, you know indigenous rights issues mm -hmm. by, um, putting a greater focus on um, on well-being as opposed to G GDP. Um, right. And we know as Indigenous peoples that well-being, uh, our well-being is intimately connected to the well-being of, of the lands, of the waters, of the natural mm -hmm. world. And so we take a different, you know, more ecological economics um, perspective for growth and, rec and economic recovery. Um, and economic resilience, uh, we have a real serious opportunity to do that right now. And I think that leaders are um, are going to be challenged to do just that very thing, to think about how we can recover from this in a, in a new way. Okay, Tyson. So let's say that we have all of Canada's leaders in the room with you and I right now, and you can tell them how to do that. Like, can you explain for folks because you're in this conservation space, how does Canada imagine, envision, and enact so-called conservation and so-called land and water management? And where, what are the shifts that need to happen in terms of like the values or the way that they relate maybe to land and like, you know, sectioning it off and creating these boundaries that natural ecosystems actually don't, you know, respect or don't exist in. So like, what would you say Canada needs to shift um, in, in its way of dealing with conservation? Thanks for the question. I think the, the is going beyond recognition um, to respect and uphold and move towards the implementation of Indigenous rights, of course. And so again, um, the Conservancy and, and in particular our team in Canada championing a lot of this work um, know that where indigenous rights are respected and upheld, um, the kind of ecological outcomes are go in parallel to that because of the reflection of our indigenous cult uh, cultural principles and values in the decision making processes. Once indigenous peoples have the right to make decisions for mm -hmm. and about their people and their territories, that the outcomes more strongly reflect a conservation ethic. Um, it might not perfectly align, but that's not the point. The point is that once um, those communities have the right to make decisions for and about their people and place, the outcome is far better um, for the natural world, um, arguably for for not only the communities but the, you know the broader um, society mm -hmm. when the rights are respected and upheld. So let's start there. Let's start mm -hmm. with greater recognition. Can we? Can you give us some examples? Where is that the case for you? Like when you say where indigenous rights are respected, acknowledged and upheld, 
the, there is a healthier ecosystem? Like where where does that exist? Or like, what can what do you mean by that? Because yeah. I think that's yeah. really key. So I just want to flesh that out a little bit. Well, um, yeah, it's tough to kind of pinpoint it, uh, um, a particular um, a particular circumstance. Uh, there are so many um, different examples of this mm -hmm. uh, across Canada and around the world. Uh, I'm trying to pull out from the files here something that resonates for that question. Mm -hmm. I mean, so to the more recent example in Thai Dene Nene um, in the Northwest mm -hmm. territories, uh, a long road on behalf of the people to have their interests on the land base recognized and upheld. And what that has resulted in is a great deal more protection, but not no touch protection, um, uh, but a, a great deal more improved management of the natural resources from perspectives that align more strongly with um, principles and values that are associated with you know natural abundance health and well-being of the natural ecosystem so there are there's so many examples where um, when offered the opportunity indigenous peoples um, um, kind of step up to the plate and manage better mm -hmm. uh, and there's movements around the world that uh, that speak to this mm -hmm. So I'm, you know, I'm doing a very good job pinpointing an exact uh, circumstance, but there's there's lots out there, and I'm sure. Yeah, there are. are. Well, yeah. I mean, I I'm writing a story right now, and it's not to give too much away, but I'm writing a story right now about the Gitmiao and this, you know, land use plan, and I'm learning about different land land management strategies. It's very like a very colonial way of talking about relating to nature, but it's the way that Canada understands managing resources, like. And so it's been really cool to hear about their their fight for the last 10 years to, you know, I guess like manipulate and kind of work with Indigenous laws so that they're respecting their own laws, which have always existed and will continue to be implemented and exist. So I like hearing about these examples, you know, just to kind of be like, look, this is happening. And I, I think people are using different strategies. Nations are using different strategies different agreements, different policies, really? different really? hats, different leadership tactics. But um, it's interesting to see the creative ways that Indigenous laws continue to exist and be upheld and that Canada must therefore adapt and change and make room and, and collapse even at some point. Yeah, well, they need to open up space for the, the nations themselves to lead the way. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, for someone who has been raised within your own laws and legal system, and so, you know, you have that relationship of the authority of that natural law, which has governed your people for thousands of years, um, what is it, how do you interact then with Canadian law? Do you consider Canada's laws legitimate? Have they been proven legitimate in your experience and in your life? How do you interact with them when you already embody and uphold your own laws? Like how do you go in between those worlds or work within that space? Yeah, these are one of the great time for our to figure out exactly what it looks like. And it's gonna look different for, for every community and how they want to approach it. They get now uh, an example of a strong hereditary system, something that we still have in a house as well. Mm -hmm. And as, um, and it's not an authority, in my opinion, it's a responsibility, but the responsibility of our hereditary system, which of course includes the responsibility of the whole the whole community and every house, it's responsibility to care for our territories and to care for each other um, is, you know, it is above and above and beyond Canadian and British Columbia law uh, to our people and to our governance system. But in my opinion, again, speaking about collaboration, we have to find a way how to work together, you know, again, COVID-19, showing that we are not alone and isolated in these circumstances, mm -hmm. uh, you know, reaching out a hand and figuring out what we can do together and overcoming those historical injustices um, and the traumas and et cetera, and finding a pathway forward that is, you know, collaborative and, um, and generative in terms of, we don't, we've never been in this situation before. We've never, we've never been in 2020 before. and. Mm -hmm. um, in a circumstance like this, where rights are being recognized at a, at a greater rate, um, where we have a kind of uh, a health crisis as well as an environmental crisis. So nobody knows mm -hmm. exactly what to do here, but we mm -hmm. have some good examples of people taking risks and leading the way. 
And mm-hmm. so for our people, it's continuing to build ourselves up, you know, to reconcile internally in our own communities, to focus on health and the health and well-being of our people first so that we can grow back the health and well-being of our governance system and then advancing that governance system as, um, you know, as, it, as a government. So mm-hmm. you know, we firmly believe that. And, you know, our approach to that is rooted in kind of the, the, the sovereignty um, of, our, of our people in our territories. Mm-hmm. And our hereditary leaders in a house that have made a declaration as such as well, which, um, mm-hmm. which I helped to, to work on several years ago. And other nations have taken it well beyond that into, into much larger agreements with, with governments. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I'll give you a break from my big questions and I'll bring someone else's question in. Um, a friend here, Josh Temple, is asking a question. Let me just see if I can get it to show up. As a person of non-Indigenous descent, what are the questions that I should be asking my Indigenous family and friends to better understand how I can support efforts in reconciliation and environmental stewardship? Yeah, thanks, Josh. Josh, of course, being from like it sound as well, I believe living in Tofino. Mm. Um, it's a question that um, that comes up a lot and I mm-hmm. always have a hard time speaking to directly because I'm not a blanket authority on these kind of things. Uh, and so I think um, kind of in the circumstance of Tofino, how is it, for example, that we need patience from, from the non-Indigenous community, um, you know, as we as we build ourselves back up. Firstly, and so you know, mm. often people want to reach out and offer support um, because they have you know personal attachment and commitment to um, you know environmental stewardship in a particular place. And what we really want to do is be sensitive to kind of the growing that back in our home communities. You know, it's great when people can come in and support. Um, conservation and stewardship in indigenous territories, but it's far better when um, organizations can be working to support and, and hold up the indigenous peoples whose responsibility um, it has been for a long time and who did it very well in the past. And that's why I love working with the Conservancy, especially our indigenous peoples and local communities program. That's our intent and focus mm-hmm. is to ask, how do you want to do this um, to our community? How do you want to do this? And then um, working patiently to find out where, um, what, how we, what we can offer can fit into that vision. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, in terms of asking questions, there aren't, you know, you know, the direct questions need to be about how can I support, um, um, you know, that's the that's the question. Mm-hmm. What is your vision? How can I support that vision? Um, mm-hmm. You know what can I be doing differently to uh, to engage, but to not um, use questioning, to not take questioning from like a like a like a positional like a stance. Like I need to ask you a question so that I can be fulfilled. Mm-hmm. Um, there needs to be a recognition that our communities are working at our own paces as well, um, but that mm-hmm. that effort over the long term will create a, a much higher value. So it's a great mm-hmm. question, Josh appreciate uh, people like Josh and their interest in working with our communities. And I would ask a lot of those to be patient um, mm-hmm. there and available to us to support when, when we're ready and need, uh, and need them. Great. And then Josh, on that note as well, like, because my job is to really investigate some stories of success and self-determination, especially within the, you know, land stewardship realm, I've been learning about all kinds of things like tribal parks program and in, in Cleoquit First Nation and indigenous food freedom and Sequetmic territories. And like there are so many different um, success stories. There are so many different indigenous led solutions. Like we kind of mentioned before that they have different names and faces, but it's also just educating ourselves on those solutions that are already happening. These indigenous led projects and organizations that already exist. And like you said, that just need Um, support or maybe even need people to get out of the way to be able to function yeah yeah. sometimes like um building relationships takes a lot of time um and a lot of effort and quite often again um people want to move very quickly because they have a passion and an interest 
and that's mm-hmm. not always um, that's not always right or appropriate um, in terms mm-hmm. of how to support indigenous communities in their um, visioning and efforts around uh, conservation, stewardship, community development, and growth. So building mm-hmm. relationships takes time um, mm-hmm. as well, and, it, and a great deal of intentionality. Um, mm. Yeah, I, it pains me sometimes to see people move far too quickly past that phase and mm-hmm. through a phase of, well, we know what's best, and thus we are going to deliver that, and we're not going to wait uh, for you to have input or say, and we we know um, best practices from the past that isn't the most effective way to do this. That to be slow, mm-hmm. to be patient, to take your time, and to co-create uh, visions together is ideal. And when mm-hmm. and where that is not available to non-indigenous community, to practice patience, and practice mm-hmm. support. Support mm-hmm. doesn't just come in terms of uh, dollars or direct support. Sometimes support is, as you said, getting out of the way or stepping back. And mm-hmm. having faith and trust in um, our governments and our systems and our cultures and our processes. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I mean, and when you look at some, when we're talking about the climate crises, right, uh, which is probably more apparent in our lifetime now than ever, as we're literally walking around and there's just people in masks and it's feeling very apocalyptic. Um, I mean, when we look at the way that environmental organizations um, function, a lot of the time it is within that capitalist mindset. It's in that, you know, hamster wheel where people are trying to get, you know, implement policies and make changes really quick and, you know, write reports without building relationships. Like you said, you know, especially with Indigenous communities, especially with communities that are the most impacted um, and just coming up with solutions based on reports. And it's all happening very quickly. And it was actually um, a scholar, an Anishinaabe scholar, Kyle Powis White, that flagged this to my attention that rushing around in trying to find solutions for the climate is like really harmful for indigenous peoples. And it actually is not at all the way that laws of nature function and the ways that communities have been able to socially coordinate for the type of cohesion needed to deal with the problems that we face today. So I do think it's really important to just constantly mention that building relationships takes time. And that's one of the most fundamental parts right now to finding solutions and the space and the cohesion that we need to be able to find, to implement those solutions. Yeah, yeah, that resonates. Um, In in opening up worldviews and space to integrate um, different Mm -hmm. systems of knowledge and different Mm -hmm. perspectives is is Mm -hmm. work. Um, yes, we can all learn how to do that better, and we can all continue to improve um, how we do that. Again, going back to the idea of collaboration, how can we co-create? Um, mm-hmm. How can we collaborate? Before you ever get to co-create and collaborate, there's a long pathway of trust building, um, mm-hmm. which is mm-hmm. which is a difficult pathway. Can that be sped up? Like, can we just implement? You know, maybe maybe folks need to just deal with. Um, psilocybin a little more experiment a little more with psilocybin and psychedelics to really just fast forward that process of like opening up world views like it feels sometimes like a very um it can feel like you're coming on a closed door sometimes when you have i mean in my conversation with ruben ruben who you know who's the head of the sacred trust uh, initiative and talking about how being in rooms with people behind like trans mountain how we just he feels like there's a lack of spirit, that there's such a distinction between the world that he's existing in, like we're talking epistemologically, and the world that other people, you know, you mentioned GD, like GDP. For some people, value and people's interests, Canada's interests is economic, it's GDP. It isn't the health and well being of the land and waters because there aren't always those relationships on a fundamental or even superficial level. So, I mean, I know that it takes time, I know that we need to have patience, but. What are your ideas around that when there does seem to be, as somebody that walks in between many worlds, and I can really relate to that being a mixed person as well. I walk in many different worlds and have to shape shift and code switch, which is both a gift and a burden at times. But what are your ideas around how how we close that gap or how we meet each other in a space where there's more connection and understanding? Yeah, that's a huge question that is, I think one of the biggest questions for our species on this planet at this time. And our, our like indigenous people, indigenous peoples around the world, um, we are 
arguably still the closest to um, an understanding of how of what that place-based connection feels like, how to respect mm -hmm. it, what the structures are that allow mm -hmm. for us to live within um, a more sustainable model where um, you know we're, we're connected to we're, we're connected to place, we're connected to lands and waters. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a part of my personal um, mission in life to bring other people into that space, not to not to poach, not to um, appropriate kind of cultural ideas. Um, everybody needs to go about it in their in their own way. Um, but for indigenous communities, we can we can invite people in um, mm -hmm. and expose them to our way of of, uh, of understanding how we connect to that natural world. And so mm -hmm. people in rather than pushing people away is um, provided that they come in and there are their you know boundaries in place and that people aren't crossing boundaries and being respectful of those boundaries. We have those lessons. Those lessons still exist. I know that mm -hmm. you know, Joe Martin a little while back, he talks a lot about things like that, a lot about um, how to reconnect to the lessons of natural law. Um, and so our people are close to that. And mm -hmm. people who listen up and pay attention when you know we're talking about <laughs> those kind of things and stop um, and stop um, diminishing those those perspectives and, and those systems of knowledge and, and rather hold them up. And there's a lot of people out there doing that as well. A lot of allies out there doing that very mm -hmm. well. To hold, to mm -hmm. hold up those ideals. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was so many allies that came out with the um, you know in support for Wet'suwet'en Nation and in with so it's in self-governance and i mean with the youth support on the legislature there in in victoria i mean there was a lot of allies that came out and i think especially on the on the west coast um in so-called bc there definitely are a lot of allies for indigenous-led projects and you don't always see that in other other parts of the country and then beyond right like i'm in a country i'm sure you know through some of your relationships here in brazil where in, in South America, in many countries, indigenous leaders are still being killed. Like there are more than 10 in Brazil that have been killed within the last few years. And so, and that happens a lot of the time, like just outside of the eyes of the media. And so when talking about implementing indigenous rights, you know, the right to live, right? The right to live and resist is, that's still very far from being respected here um, in these territories with our relatives in the South. I think Deborah, Deborah Sparrow posted a comment here that summarizes in her own words what I was trying to say in that mm -hmm. we have our practices, our traditional cultural practices that, that we fall back on um, mm -hmm. in times of crisis. Um, and so and, and we and so we can do that as Indigenous peoples. And I think the question I have for other uh, people is how do we invite others into that space mm -hmm. um, with healthy boundaries? Again, like what's happening in Brazil, as you've mentioned, is 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 traumatic. It's um, it's horrible. And mm -hmm. How do we overcome those? I don't I don't know how we overcome those issues, uh, mm -hmm. other than by um, you know through our, our our practices. You know, forgiveness, love, um, caring, teaching. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I've been taught. Uh, other people might have different opinions about how how to approach um, kind of the lack of recognition that continues to exist. Mm -hmm. So Tyson, I heard you say in an interview, like it's my job to creep a little bit, right? And your Facebook is difficult to creep because I think your photos are still from 2015 and 16, but right. I did my best and I did come across a video and you kind of talked about that you could have really, your parents empowered you to take on whatever job that you wanted. You could have been a professional motorcycle driver or what do you call it? Motor motorists? I don't know what the word is. Sure. Or mm -hmm. you could have been you know, you could have just been spend most of your time on the water, been a fisherman. Oh, here's a motorcycle shot of you and your dad. Mm -hmm. Or you could like there's a lot of different things that you could have done. But you actually you were on council for four years. Is that right? And you've decided to take your position as um, hereditary chief in training. Um, there's probably a more appropriate way to say that. But why did you choose the path that you chose or was there much choice in it? There's always a choice. But it is who I am. Mm. Uh, I believe in it. I believe in its power, and it's not authoritative power, but I believe in kind of the power of our teachings to transform uh, circumstances 
uh, for people's betterment. We have a uh, great history in my family and in, in our Ahousat lineages, um, transitioning um, from fisheries to whaling to sealing and, you know, between um, different forms and, and models of harvest and kind of learning about that historically, our people, um, you know, became experts in sustainability. Hmm. And so I, um, I believe in that. I believe that those are profoundly important lessons for how to be a good human being on this planet. And um, rather than pursue kind of other, um, other interests, I, and it's not easy, right? I mean, these pathways aren't easy. Um, they're very challenging because it's, it's, it's about um, transformation. Transformation is very, very difficult. And we're mm -hmm. always in kind of that, that state right now of needing to iterate and to, to learn from the past to, to move forward in the future in a better way. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's another huge question but it just feels right to me mm -hmm. um, for lack of a better expression. It feels right in my gut uh, mm -hmm. to follow those lessons, but it's not always going to look exactly like it looked in the past as well. Mm -hmm. uh, every right. generation as we move forward will change the way things happen. Mm -hmm. um, and that's our right as the next generation as well. Uh, and mm -hmm. so there continues to be a choice with how it unveils itself um, in the future. And it will continue mm -hmm. to change and be different. I think being open to that change and being open to being open to that change is very important as well. Um, to not be rigidly structured in anything, but to be more flexible. Um, so people knew that as well. You know, adaptability is a big part mm -hmm. of our of why we were very successful as a people in living in place and caring for place. Mm -hmm. so how do we how do we stay adaptable? Um, I think grounding oneself in our traditions is the best way um, to find out how we can move forward into a better, healthier future. Mm. I'm still learning it. It's a lifetime of learning. It'll mm -hmm. never, it never goes away. And that's also amazing, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. To continue learning and, and continue growing. So I was never going to be a professional motorcycle racer. I'm not good enough. <laughs> not good enough. I'm not good enough. Um, and I'm not good enough at this either, but it is something that, that resonates for me. Uh, and it is something that I've been, I've had the privilege of through family and mentors, and colleagues and friends, um, mm -hmm. encouraged to do mm -hmm. all of that good energy. Mm. I mean, so did you grow up within your culture, within your legal system, laws, ceremonies and traditions? And so was that always to some extent normalized for you in your way of being in the world? Um, and if so, or if not, either which way, can you share a moment, uh, maybe more in your adolescence or adult life, when it it was just so apparent to you that your legal system, your laws were just so real, so legitimate, so fully alive, and so fully going to be alive for generations to come? That's cool. So, I've had the privilege of, of many experiences like that. And so to answer the question at the beginning, yes, I was raised as best my family could in what they know what they knew best, which they learned from grandparents and elders and generations past. And so uh, they did their best with me. And uh, in, ter in terms of the given circumstance of post-residential school era and et cetera. Um, so I was raised with the best that we know. In my mm -hmm. um, and then more broadly in a house, again, a house is a beautiful place that holds onto its, onto its traditions um, very tightly. And, um, a lot of those experiences are very private, and I'm sure that a lot of my um, Indigenous peers out there would agree that a lot of our, our deeply spiritual and cultural experiences are very private. And so I'm reluctant to kind of share details, but I can assure you that there have been several moments where the idea of Heshikish Tzawak, our neutronic way of saying everything in one and interconnected, that there are forces beyond our immediate recognition and control, uh, is very much real and alive. I've felt it. I've seen it. I've experienced it. I've I've witnessed, and I've been a part of um, direct interaction and relationship at a spiritual level with the natural world. In some circumstances, facilitated by our elders and by our our um, our teachers and our you know, our cultural leaders, mm -hmm. and in other circumstances, on my own where the world's mm -hmm. opened up to me and let me in and shown me um, those lessons 
particularly of you know humility um where mm. you suddenly are very very aware that there's a lot more going on out here than I am aware of <laughs> that I have the power to control and I am mm -hmm. kind of humbly at its lesson and mercy mm -hmm. Uh, and so I've had some pretty amazing experiences in, um, kind of in the bush, if you will, but also uh, in ceremony um, as facilitated by our cultural leaders. It's, a, it's real. Our stories are true. And that's something that um, my late great grandmother said to uh, my father and said to me. And you know, it's something that we carry in our family that our stories are true. Mm. And that's it. That's that's the bottom line. And I have felt and witnessed and experienced that mm -hmm. also somebody that you know enjoys critical critical thinking and, and science and exploration I right. also absolutely felt our stories being true and and walked in that space in that true narrative which is mm -hmm. wonderful and a great privilege and so um i want to carry those lessons forward and see if i can help take those lessons that i've been given and have a positive impact on the world in some way and I choose mm -hmm. to do so at this time through the conservation sector, again, helping both our people uh, as well as um, Mother Earth recover from injustice. Mm -hmm. Does the term Mother Earth, is that culturally appropriate? I mean, I think it's used globally in a lot of a lot of spaces that I've been in, you know, here in the South, it's, it's used, but I think when you get to specific communities, whether it's great spirit or the land or waters, there's different names that come in, but do you like and use the term mother earth? Does that come from, from your culture, your community or? There's a word that comes as I know from my family um, mm -hmm. directly um, uh, that I was taught by my grandfather. And I don't know if it's actually in common usage amongst new channel communities or even in a house. This is just something that he shared with me. Um, and his, the word that he shared with me is how would, Umi. Um, and I'm not a linguist and I can't break it all down for you, but the kind of the root of hap, hap with, um, hap wea, um, we use um, as a term for hereditary leadership, for the creator, uh, essentially for giving. Um, it's a word of giving. Um, and so his interpretation of that word means um, not, not just, sorry, not just giving, but also wealth. Um, mm -hmm. Wealth and abundance in terms of wealth of being able to care for. And so his his word, his word, Hawit Umi, uh, he translated for me as meaning wealthy mother. Uh, mm -hmm. And so a caregiver, right? Um, and I was actually talking with a colleague yesterday who was asking my opinion about how it feels to go back um, to a house of territories. And we kind of went through like what it looks like, the colors and et cetera, et cetera. But um, got to a place where I was talking about the watersheds as arteries. And that mm. all of the territories are is, is a is a living is a living entity, and we are, you know, but humble seeds that have been grown by this place, and been this place is our teacher. This place is our caregiver, um, and you don't want to abuse that. You want to reciprocate that in some way. So how do we reciprocate that back? Our cultures, our traditions. We knew that. We knew about those. We established that. We listened to the laws. We established those protocols and we practiced lawful practices that keep those protocols in place. We've forgotten a lot of it, not our fault. Um, mm -hmm. The world has forgotten a lot of it. So how do we return to an understanding of that? So for me, that's my way, that's my personal way of reflecting on on, on the earth. This, this concept mm -hmm. of Umi, of a teacher, of a caregiver. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, other people will have their own. That's that's for us though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have a couple more comments I want to make sure to address. Just as a follow-up, Josh has said here, thank you, Tyson and Emily. That was a very insightful answer. Patience is a practice that does not always manifest easily in non-Indigenous culture. Supporting tribal parks programs and working on environmental projects in traditional territories in partnership with local First Nations has been a huge learning process for me. Navigating these questions is sometimes difficult, but deeply illuminating. Thank you for your comments. Yeah, Josh. And then, sorry, go ahead. Look forward to the next question with Josh in the future. But some sometimes these learning processes are intergenerational. Again, mm -hmm. we are coming out of as Indigenous peoples, many and it's still happening. Um, mm -hmm. We're not coming out of anything actually necessarily. We're still a part of multi generational oppression, mm -hmm. and so it's going to take uh, likely mm -hmm. generations to move into a new future past mm -hmm. that. 
participation spans generations, which is, of course, a, a teaching of ours as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Another comment here, and it looks like it might go farther than we can actually read at this point. But anyways, we'll start it off. Indigenous peoples have long advocated that the conservation and restoration of native species, the cultivation of first foods, and the maintenance of spiritual practices required the existence of plants, animals, a particular genetic parentage whose lives are woven through with ec ecologically, economically, and culturally significant stories and knowledge. You get that, Tyson? Mm -hmm. Indigenous conservationists and preservationists tend to focus on sustaining particular plants and animals whose lives are entangled locally. And then it and then it's lost. I've lost the next part of that. But any thoughts on that, Tyson? That kind of mind? Yeah. Yeah. It, that feels like it's focused. Um, we like a lot of not a lot. Most indigenous peoples, um, you know, had cultivation practices, uh, mm -hmm. and we learned those over over observation and over you know gifts being given um, by the natural world to us. Many many generations of people. And so we understood that. And I would assume um, like the question was, or the comment was about kind of the cultivation of specific things that um, were life-giving forces for us. And so mm -hmm. that was a part of our protocol was to practice and care for those particular life-giving forces. I love the word hinkoas in our language, which is the word for uh, chum salmon or dog salmon. Um, it, it, it means it's another way of saying giving beings. So our word for for uh, not just people but beings is koas, um, and I think some of my family would say it particularly referred to kind of that indigeneity of being, um, not 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 just for humans but for all but for all beings. Um, and that these dogs and like we acknowledge the dogs and by naming them as such because they're such important species to our people. And then, of course, we have more kind of scientific oriented practices of uh, restoration and maintenance of streams that were common to our people for many years prior to, to Western contact. Um, and so to the, to the comment, a lot of people have a lot of different roles, right? And so some people are caretakers of that particular place. That was a, that was a, that was a practice of our government as well, of our housing mm -hmm. government, where families were responsible for areas that they come from and for stewarding those watersheds that they come from. And maybe that particular, um, you know, patch of, of thimbleberry or, or thistle or whatever, that particular stand of cedars. Um, and so returning to those ways of being is very important, in my opinion. And so restructuring our governments around kind of an understanding of, of caretaking and of that responsibility for and how we do that is very important. Um, yeah, it's a great, I would love to read what what else was there? <laughs> hey, we can find it on Facebook afterwards and engage, but we have another uh, a comment. Thank you, Tyson, for sharing with us. Appreciated the opportunity to listen. Looking forward to the work that all of our communities can do together and to a future where we build better understanding. Yeah, I love that comment. I think, I'm glad that that's resonating uh, for everybody. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna reiterate mm -hmm. the point over and over again that, mm -hmm. especially at this time, it's proof mm -hmm. that we're in it together. Mm -hmm. um, some people think that they can separate themselves from that, and it, <laughs> over a long period of time, we'll see that proven false, right? We mm -hmm. know that we are connected, mm -hmm. um, difference, um, connected mm -hmm. as people, connected to mm -hmm. systems, and I'm mm -hmm. for coming together if we can. It's not easy, though. It's definitely mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. um, you know. It's not even easy within ourselves as mixed, yeah. you know, being mixed, like you are you, your mother is non-indigenous what what's the genealogy there is that is that right she's not indigenous yeah and where was where's her family from her ancestry um europe are, are, they're canadian of course um right they chased our genetic roots back to italy um germany poland england uh -huh. ireland um right. not you know haven't explored that to a tremendous degree personally because my mm -hmm. deep connection also comes from a house it but my right. family members have connected to their roots absolutely which is their mm -hmm. right and i'm totally. really excited when i've got i've got quite a few friends that are irish um mm -hmm. hopefully none of them are watching this but uh, <laughs> i'm really excited when people want to connect to where they came from uh, yes that's beautiful and it doesn't need to be um doesn't need to be looked down on mm -hmm. uh, and it, 
it's maybe controversial to say, once upon a time, everybody was indigenous to some place, of course. Mm -hmm. Connecting as close as we can to where that place was and the lessons and the teachings of that place, they're there, buried mm -hmm. in history sometimes and oppressed right. themselves. And that's why it's wonderful for our indigenous communities today to be you know, holding themselves up and for others to be holding us up because we're so close to that still. Yeah. Um, we right. are resilient through the mm -hmm. oppression and you know, mm -hmm. we have access to that um, to mm -hmm. a certain degree and we're gonna keep growing it. But mm -hmm. I, I love that stuff. I, you know, we're all human beings. We all do come from somewhere. Um, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. to find those connections is pretty magical as well because we can't deny that, I think one of your earliest questions was, like, was about like, how do we bring people back to this understanding of connection to place? And um, it's hard work. And so if people mm -hmm. are interested in connecting to the place that you know they came from, the mm -hmm. languages, you know, the traditional languages of those places, that's I think that's fascinating and amazing work because it's very mm -hmm. it's very much a privilege as well to have that connection here and to be so close to home. That's right. It is very much a privilege, and it you know it's also a testament to strength, the strength and resili resiliency of people. But I. Of course, I think to people who have been ripped from their homelands or whose ancestors have been ripped from their homelands. And so that tracing back is sometimes impossible, yeah. right? And just yeah. recognizing that there's there's different processes for people that looks very different. But the reason I brought that up, my mother is also non-Indigenous. I mix, I'm Cree Métis, Filipino, and then on my mom's side, three and four generation settler from like Ireland and Scotland and England. And in some ways it's like, hey, you know what, where were my great grandparents from on this side? And there's like this great forgetting. I don't know if it's like a convenience or if it comes from World War II trauma, box yourself into this house and, you know, I don't know, but I do think that that journey is really, because it's all laid out there on my Cree Métis side, I can go back 15 generations, like carefully documented, you know, but on, on the other side, it's, that's not really, a, it hasn't been a cultural practice. And that's, you know, in some ways I think that it should be a responsibility for Canadians and for non-Indigenous folks as well to do that work, to ask those questions, um, whether it's culturally encouraged or not. But we do have another question as we kind of wrap up here. Tyson, well, it's not a question, more of a comment. Tyson, you need to take government officials on awakening journey. Then maybe, only then, can we find that balance between worlds Prime Minister first. I don't mean for a week. Yeah. <laughs> Find that so first you have to start off with Justin Trudeau. Have you met Just? I feel like you've met Justin Trudeau. What was that like? I or maybe you, you haven't met him? No, I've spent a lot of uh, a lot of time in the presence of a lot of great leaders. Um, mm -hmm. I have not met Justin Trudeau. Um, yeah, so like this comment about helping people return, I love doing that. I love bringing people and showing them and teaching them um, we've done some of that work at the Conservancy where Indigenous communities are willing to do that for even our staff or people that want to contribute to the work, uh, bringing people out on the land and expressing who we are. Um, you know, it, it really makes a difference in, in how people see and, and feel their way through life. Um, mm -hmm. it, yeah, I think to the point about um, tracing ancestry and et cetera, a lot of it is about survival as well mm -hmm. <laughs> survival and identity mm -hmm. in terms of like staying alive um mm -hmm. and staying healthy and staying sane and we can't we can't blame people for that um mm -hmm. for, for trying to survive you know we're all trying to do that now and i think again given the circumstances that we know that we're all surviving together and so mm -hmm. collaborate more effectively across those differences to survive together uh, it's a long road ahead Last small little question before we finish. What's the meaning of life? Goodness. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I just, I mean, every question I hit, you just, you receive and you, you offer such a graceful, humble, thoughtful response. I'm just so grateful for this conversation today and for your time. So thank you so much. Are there any other thoughts that you want to share as we come full circle here? You know, I appreciate the opportunity to share the, the work that I'm passionate about, you know, the Indigenous-led conservation work. Um, mm -hmm. Another question about what can we be doing better to recover from the current um, health crisis without losing sight of the environmental crisis uh, and ensuring that as we move forward into economic crisis, that it doesn't uh, marginalize mm -hmm. and, uh, people further. We have an opportunity mm -hmm. here uh, to change the way we do business, to change um, the way we think about our relations to each other 
Um, and I look forward to people coming out of this with positive uh, feelings and hope uh, for the future and, and people finding ways to come together more effectively. I appreciate the opportunity to share some of those messages. Um, mm. Well, we appreciate you as well. And where can people follow you if they want to continue following your work and the Nature Conservancy? What's the best way to like reach you and see what you're involved in? Yeah, sure. I mean, I would encourage following the Nature Conservancy's work for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and and talking about it and, and asking questions. In in Canada, um, our program is called is actually called Nature United. You know, mm -hmm. check out the websites, the Instagram mm -hmm. feeds. Uh, Twitter feeds, etc. I don't do a lot of that. My head is always buried in project work and in relation mm -hmm. to building work. Um, but I'm always happy to connect with people. Mm -hmm. Hi, hi. Clicko, clicko. Thank you very much. Yes, big clicko to everybody that, that joined and for the questions and for the time. Great. Thank you so much. Have a great day and we'll be in touch. You're welcome back here anytime. We'd love to hear you. you. Oh, sorry. We've got the second part. Let's just make sure to include this here. The second part is indigenous conservationists and preservationists tend to focus on sustaining particular plants and animals whose lives are entangled locally and often over many generations in ecological, cultural, and economic relationships with human societies and other non-human species. We try to learn from, adapt, and put in practice these relationships, ancient as some may be, to address the conservation challenges. What challenges are you focusing on? Plant, animal, genetic parentage, cultural significance, etc. So why don't you give that, that question to Saab before we close off? I'm not particularly focusing on, on anything at that level of detail. I'm My work is focused on supporting kind of indigenous governance um, to ensure that those communities can decide where they want to focus in the future, um, mm -hmm. and how, to, how to move their, their own work forward. That's my job is to try to support that. On a personal note, I am, you know, I have spent time looking at a specific um, a specific species of, of Pacific salmon in a very specific watershed. And so I totally understand that. Um, and I think mm -hmm. we need to look at that level because our people did that in the past. We looked at specific places and we managed specific places in a specific way. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, the job is to support communities and how they want to how they want to roll that out. Mm. So many good thoughts in my head. The thing that just keeps sticking is watersheds as arteries. <laughs> It just keeps sticking with me. So I, I just love, I love some of the examples you've shared. So thank you so much. I'll let you get back to work now. Awesome. Thank you all. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.